invited to Ozark Full Gospel Church, located in Ozark, Missouri, where we are touching the Ozark with Jesus Christ. Sit back, enjoy, as Pastor James A. can bring forth God's exciting word. At Ozark Full Gospel Church, we have three exciting services every week. Our service times are Sunday morning at 10.30, Sunday night at 6 p.m., and Wednesday night at 7 o'clock. There is meaningful praise and worship and powerful Bible preaching at every service, and we never close for any reason. In addition, be sure to follow us on social media to stay up to date with all of our upcoming events and most current information. We look forward to seeing you soon, right here where we are touching the Ozarks with Jesus Christ. You can clap your hands if you want to. You got to keep on keeping on till the journey's over and the victory's won. Don't give up before the race is run. The Lord above will stand by you do what's right and see it through. Yeah. Trust in God and keep on keeping on. Yep. Thank you, Lord. It's hard these days just getting by. Can't get ahead and you don't know why. Struggles last from dawn to setting sun. Oh, yeah. When you know the Lord won't let you down, peace of mind can still be found. Keep the faith and keep on keeping on. You gotta keep on keeping on till the journey's over and the victory's won. Don't give up before the race is run. The Lord above will stand by you. Do what's right and see it through. Trust in God and keep on keeping on. Such a blessing to get together and love the Lord and magnify God. Amen. Woo! Praise God. We're blessed. Amen. And uh, excited about all that God is doing. I want you to open up your Bibles with me, please, to St. Mark chapter 8. St. Mark chapter 8. We're going to begin reading with verse 22 down to verse 26. Let's stand for the reading of God's Word. Amen. Praise God. Love the Bible. Love to preach from it. 
And it says, And Jesus comes to Bethsaida, and they bring a blind man unto him. And they begged him, besought him to touch him. And he took the blind man by the hand and led him out of town. When he had spit on his eyes, he put his hands upon him, and he asked him if he saw aught. And the man looked up and said, I see men as trees walking. And after that, Jesus put his hands again upon his eyes and made him look up. And he was restored and every, saw every man clearly. And Jesus sent him away to his house, saying, Neither go into the town, nor tell it to any in the town. I draw your attention to verse 24. And when the blind man looked up, this is the first time, he said, I see men as trees walking. I want to use for a subject tonight, when trees begin to move, you may be seated. When trees begin to move. Now, the story is incredible. In fact, it is amazing to think that Jesus Christ would take this man and spit on his eyes, lay hands on him, and then he would ask him, do you see anything? This blind man, I don't know whether he became blind young as a child, whether he was born blind, whether he got blind as he was older, the Bible does not say. But the Bible does say that he was blind. And how many know when Jesus asked him, do you see anything? The man says, I see men as trees walking. Well, that would never do. So Jesus touched him again. That means you need to keep Jesus close within touching range. Because you never know when you're going to see things bigger than they ought to be. Amen? This man had a tremendous problem. He began to see things bigger than what they really were. And um, that happens in our lives. It isn't always uh, physical men as trees walking. Many times it's just problems in our life and we see it as huge mountains. And you shouldn't say, look, look, look at the problem. You ought to say, look, look, look at the God that looms over the problem. Well, God in great power and majesty that cares about our lives. And so Jesus made him look up a second time. He got nothing on me. Jesus made me look up hundreds of times. <laughs> Anybody would agree with that? Jesus makes me look up over and over and over and over and over and over again. And the truth is, you do the same. If you don't, you're not much of a Christian. There you had it. There I told you how it was. Christians live a life of looking up. We got saved by looking up, and we continue to walk in our deliverance by looking up. Christians are looking up. And by the way, since we're looking up, then things are looking up for us. Amen? I'm going to go a little different direction, and we're talking about when trees start moving. How many would agree that when trees start moving, it must be one powerful storm if you're having a nightmare? I can't imagine how that man must have felt when he looked and he saw me and his trees walking. And that must have terrified him. Because he was seeing something bigger than what it really was. And that's one of the great lessons we find in this story. Is that many times we see things bigger than what they really are. And they're not just standing there in silence or standing there in deadness. They are moving. You know, a problem that's not moving isn't really scary. But when your problem starts moving, that's scary. Amen. And so I want to talk to you. Some of you are going in different directions, and, and sometimes the Lord chooses for you to go in a direction that you're really not prepared for, but God knows he's prepared for it. And many times we have to just say to the Lord, you will need to walk me through this unknown. 
God needs to walk us through this unknown. I know that many of you have faced things in the past and it was unknown territory. You hadn't passed that way before. When I think of going some direction that you've never went before, and some folks go the same direction over and over again because it's another trip around Mount Sinai for them. And sometimes we just wander in the wilderness because we are doofuses. We don't catch on and get the truth. You say, what's a doofus? I don't know. Ask your neighbor. They probably know what one is. But one thing we need to understand, that the Lord, when we're facing something we've never faced before, the unknown, God is going to have to walk us through it. He's going to have to walk us through the unknown. That brings me to the thought about Joshua, chapter 3, verse 4. Let's go to Joshua, chapter 3, and verse 4. And uh, you say, why don't you stick around the blind man? Well, he's healed. It's time to move on to something else. It's what Jesus did, amen? But the children of Israel were getting ready to go across into Canaan land. And God told them that your diet's going to change. You're going to eat different food. You're not going to eat the manna. You're not going to eat like you were in the wilderness. You're going to go in and you're going to live in houses that you didn't build. You're going to have food, a dietary plan. And of course, you have to be guided by God himself. But he said, you're going to go enter into an area you've never been before, a new diet, a new place to live. I mean, you lived in tents. Some of them people had lived in tents their whole life. They were born in a tent. And many of them died in a tent. But now they're going into a permanent place called Canaan land. And they're going to go somewhere they've never gone before. And they're getting ready to cross Jordan. Jordan is full bank. This is harvest time. And Jordan is, you can see this in the third chapter of Joshua, it's full bank. It's, it's flood waters. It's harvest time, flood waters. God never does anything easy. He always picks the complicated and the big stuff. So if you're in a big mess, then good news, God loves big messes. Understand that God takes care of your little stuff, but he loves to see you in deep water. God loves to see you trust in him when you're going through a hard time because God likes to flex his muscles in our life. Amen. And so God waited there's places in Jordan's pretty, pretty you know, small uh, when it's not harvest time. But now Jordan is full flooded, massive amount of water. And God's getting ready to take the children of Israel across Jordan into Canaan land. And he tells Joshua, God tells Joshua, get ready. You're going to go someplace you've never gone before. New diet, new place, you're going to be going somewhere you've never gone before. And notice in verse, um, well, look at verse 3. I said verse 4, but we're going to look at uh, 3 and 4. Are you there, Joshua chapter 3? And they commanded the people, saying, When you shall see the ark of the covenant of the Lord your God, and the priest and the Levites carrying it or burying it, And ye shall remove from your place and go after it. You are to remove yourself from your place and pursue God. You're not to just sit there. You're not to just pine away in your tent. You're to go forward and possess the land. You are to pursue God. And when you see the ark of the covenant begin to move, look at verse 4. Yet there shall be a space between you and it. About 2,000 cubits by measure. That's a, that's a little over a half a mile. So there's going to be a little over a half a mile that you're going to space yourself from the ark. And he says, come not near unto it, that you may know the way by which you must go. For you have not passed this way hitherto for. I love them words, hitherto for. You've not passed this way before. 
You're going somewhere that you've never been before. And the advice is, and the command from God is, it, 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 it was, I'm sounding like Porky Pig. It, 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 it is. But anyway, uh, I've been watching too many Looney Tunes. But anyway, <laughs> but uh, the Bible says you've never went this way before. And he said, you need to be careful because you don't want to get caught up in the masses. You don't want to get lost or drowned in the masses. He said, I want you to space yourself about a, a little over a half a mile away so that you can see the Ark of the Covenant going across the river so that you don't get caught up in the crowd. You're looking from a distance, so you're eyeballing the Ark of the Covenant, but you're giving yourself some space so you don't get trampled by doubt and unbelief. So you don't get misguided by the masses. Probably several hundred thousands and thousands upon thousands, maybe even up in the millions, are going to cross this river. And so there has to be a, a distance, half a mile, a little more than a half a mile distance, so that they don't get caught up. Because if you just follow the masses, you're liable to end up in Tulupo, Mississippi or something. Amen. And if you're, if you're from Tulupo, Mississippi, I just, I just drug that off the map. I don't know. But it's, a, it, it's important that we understand that God has a purpose for our life, and that purpose doesn't mean you following everybody else. It means you following God. Amen? Amen. It means that you listen from God. And notice he says, give yourself some space. Give yourself some space, verse 4, because when you go across, what's going to happen is the, 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 the priests are going to carry that Ark of the Covenant on their shoulders. And when they carry that Ark of the Covenant, you, you stand back from a distance and you focus on the presence of God. The Ark of the Covenant is the presence, uh, presence of God. You focus on the presence of God. Don't you focus on the, the people. You focus on the presence of God. You focus on the Ark of the Covenant. Because that's where God said, I'll put my presence. And so you focus on that, and the priests are carrying that Ark of the Covenant on their shoulders, and they're walking out, and the, and the chapter 3 talks about, as they stepped into Jordan, and the water came to the brim of their shoes, as they stepped into Jordan, immediately Jordan just dams up. It just looks like God put his hand across the river, and it just backed up all the way to the city of Adam. Wow, that'll preach right there, all the way to the city of Adam. And the rest of the water just went all the way to the Dead Sea. So now they've got the water stopped. God's dammed it up, backs it up all the way to the city of Adam. It's ran into the Dead Sea, and now the children of Israel are to watch the Ark of the Covenant and give space so that they can walk across on the dry ground. And they did so. But don't forget the phrase, you've never passed this way before. And if you've never passed this way before, then remember that you have to give God space. Remember, you have to be careful if you've never passed this way before. Remember, you have to be cautious if you've never passed this way before. Are you, are you following me? And the way to be cautious is to focus on the presence of God, give space, back up, don't follow the masses, back up, and focus on just the voice of God, just the Ark of the Covenant. Give yourself some space. And he, and he tells him very clearly in that verse 3, you have not passed this way before. And he says there in that first sentence of verse 4 of chapter 3, you shall be, there shall be a space between you and it. How big? Over half a mile. That's a big space. I understand that. But there was a lot of hundreds of hundreds of thousands of people going to go. And if you know anything about masses of people, the Ark of the Covenant could actually get uh, blotted out in your vision 
unless you back up far enough that you can focus on the ark. Focus on the presence of God. Are you following me tonight? Are you getting this? Isn't this, this is really good wisdom. I didn't come up with it. The Lord did. Trust me, I don't come up with much wisdom. But anyway, the Lord gives this. No, don't trust me. But anyway, Joshua says we're to give a space. And I mean, no, in tragedies, we're to give God place. When troubles come, we're not only to give, if we've never passed away, and J.R., you're passing, you're going a direction you've never gone before. Some of you in this room, you're going a direction you've never gone before. So give space. And then we need to give place if something tragic happens. We'd always give place to God. Look at Matthew 9, verse 23 and 26. Matthew chapter 9. Verse 23 to verse 26. And Jesus came into the ruler's house. That's Jairus. He has a daughter that's 12 years old. She's dying. In fact, she's dead here. And, And Jairus is going on the way with Jesus. Jesus has been asked to touch her. And when they, you know, they got interrupted by the lady with an issue of blood for 12 years and and that sidetracked it. And when they got there, it seemed like Jesus showed up late. And how many know Jesus don't show up late? We do, but he doesn't. And they sent someone outside the house of Jairus, the, the synagogue ruler. He was a, the Bible says a certain ruler. And they sent someone out to him and say, don't trouble the master. She's dead. Your, your baby's dead. And Jesus Christ says to the daddy, just... Just keep your faith. Keep, keep your trust. Notice in verse 23, And Jesus came into the ruler's house and saw the minstrel and the people making noise, booing, crying. And back then they paid for people to actually boohoo and cry at funerals. You don't have to do that if you're a nice person and you die. They'll cry for you anyway. They may have to har some for me when I go. But anyway, but people cry. And back then they hired criers. If they'll get a hold of me, I know some of them in this church. They cry about everything. Boo, hoo, hoo. It's always, huh? It's disaster every time they turn around. So you talking about me? Probably. You thinking of a name? Nope. Do I look like an idiot? No, I'm not thinking of a name. And the Bible says that they were making noise. They were crying. And Jesus said in verse 24, this little girl's upstairs. She's dead. And he says unto them, give place. Give place. The maid is not dead, but sleeping. And they laughed him to scorn. But when the people were put out, I mean, you want to get put out. You want to be driven out. You want to be put away. Just laugh at Jesus. You'll be put out. And they were laughing at Jesus. And they put him out of the house. And Jesus went in. Do you know that's what I want to be? I want that to be the story of my life. Jesus went in. When I've got problems in my life, I want it to be the story of my life. Jesus went in. When I'm in trouble, I want it to be Jesus went in. When I need a help, some help from above, I want that phrase, Jesus went in. And he went in, the Bible says. And took her by the hand and said, Maid, arise. And the maid arose. And the fame thereof went abroad into all the land. Did you know Jesus is famous? I said, Jesus is famous. In a good way, he's famous. And so, remember the phrase, give place to God. When you're going through a hard time, give place to God. Give space to God when you've never went this way before. Give space in prayer. Give space in focusing on the presence of God. When you're going through a horrific deal, and I may would agree that Jairus had a horrific deal. His 12-year-old daughter was dead. 
but he gave place to God. And I want you to know, no matter what you face in your life, if it's tragic, as tragic as death, give place to God. They laughed at Jesus. He said, put away the flowers. He said, put away the crying. Get out, 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 out. There's not going to be a funeral here today. Goodbye. And Jesus Christ said, tell it, kumai, as it to say, little damsel, arise. He took her by the hand, and she sat up, and she arose from her bed of death, her place of sleep. And understand, death is just sleep. For God, death is just sleep. And God went and woke her up. Amen? Called her by name. You know, there's one thing about Jesus when he, when he, when he um, cast the devil out of someone. He never got them down and rubbed their head full of oil and, and gave them a knuckle rub on their hair and said, come out. When Jesus Christ cast out a demon, he never wrestled with them. He never beat them. He never laid hands on them. In fact, he never laid hands on them. He just said, out, out. He spoke to them, go. That's the proper way to cast out demons, by the way. Preaching the gospel and just taking authority through the gospel. That's the proper way. Amen. Come on now. I'm preaching better than you're responding. Not only did Jesus speak to the demon-possessed person and speak to the demons out, but when it came time for a person that was asleep, dead, such as Lazarus, such as a young man at the city of Nain in a casket, such as a 12-year-old daughter. He didn't say out. He said, in, in, come in, come, arise. That's what he said to Lazarus, come forth. That's what he said to the young man in the casket. Young man, I say unto thee, get up, arise. He took the damsel by the hand and said, Arise. As if Jesus is talking to them in the next room. And by the way, they are in the next room. It's called God's eternal presence. Isn't that beautiful? And so when you're going through a hard time, give place to God. Now, this man saw trees moving. We go back to the blind person. At nighttime, when it gets dark, at nighttime, the forest is full of scary things. And how many would agree with me, seeing men walk around and you think they're trees walking would be pretty scary. But let's remember this. If scary things are in your way and troubling you, remember this. We must trust and believe our God to take us through. We must trust and believe our God to take us through. Amen? That brings me to the third point. And that is trust and believe your way through whatever you're going through. Go with me to John chapter 20, verse 29. John chapter 20, verse 29. And you remember... Thomas saying, except I see the nail prints in the hands of Jesus, put my finger in the print of nails, except I see his pierced side, put my hand in his side, I will not believe when the disciples said to Thomas, we've seen the Lord. And Thomas said, I ain't going to believe till I put my finger in the print of nails. I'm not going to believe until I put my hand in his pierced side. Nope, not going to believe you guys. You're, you're, you're mistaken. You must have saw a vision or something. And so Jesus shows up the following Sunday because Thomas skipped the first Sunday. That'll preach. Thomas was not there the first Sunday. That's the first day. And he missed out on a lot of stuff. But he showed up the second one. And they said to him, we've seen the Lord. And he said, I don't believe it. Well, Jesus shows up, and he says to Thomas, behold my hands. 
Reach hither thy finger and put it in the print of nails. Behold my side, thrust thy hand in my side. Be not faithless, but believing. Look at that in verse 27. Reach hither thy finger, Jesus said to Thomas. And behold my hands, and reach hither thy hand and thrust it into my side. And be not faithless, but believing. What's, what, we, what are we supposed to do? We're to trust and believe. And Thomas answered and said unto him, My Lord and my God. That is the most stout, most profound, most incredible statement that Jesus is God. And Thomas fell at the feet of Jesus and said, My Lord and my God. Verse 29. And Jesus saith unto him, Thomas, because thou hast seen me, thou hast believed. Blessed are they at Ozark Full Gospel Church. Blessed are they that's going through a hard time. Blessed are they that have not seen, yet they believe. We must trust and believe our way through. It may be dark, swampy, fearful, and scary, but we must trust and believe our way through. Because I haven't seen Jesus physically, I haven't put my finger in the print of nails physically. I haven't put my hand in his pierced side physically. I haven't seen Jesus geographically, physically in a place. But you know what? I'm just as much saved as Apostle Paul. I'm just as much saved as Peter, James, and John. And I'm just as much saved as Thomas. And I have an extra blessing because Thomas had an extra discipline. I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, and I trust him as my Savior. And Jesus Christ said, there are those that have not seen, yet they believe. Blessed are those that have not seen, yet they believe. A special blessing to you. Though you haven't seen, yet you believe. A special blessing to people that believe in God, even though you haven't seen him literally, physically. I feel him, and I hear him. I haven't seen him um, tangibly. If I had, I wouldn't be here tonight. Because I'd have went, poof, disintegrated. Now, you listen to me. There's people on the Internet that say, I saw God. You know, he was nine foot tall and 500 pounds and broad shoulders. And he, I saw Jesus. And he said, if you don't send me a million dollars, I'm going to die. Hello. And we laugh at that, but he got the million dollars. Actually, I think it was two or three million. But anyway. And I, and I don't want to go there because I don't want to sound cynical or critical. But the truth is, when you hear people say, I saw Gabriel, I saw Michael. I was seeing a little old clip on YouTube, there, and, and this, this, this person said, I saw Gabriel, and I saw Michael. And I'm thinking, you did? Daniel saw Gabriel and Michael, and he was sick for three weeks. He couldn't stand to stand up. He couldn't sleep. It drove him nuts. And her mascara wasn't even messed up. And she saw Michael and Gabriel. Now, I'm not calling her a liar, but I really doubt it. I said, well, you're just a doubter. I may be a doubter, but I'm, I might doubt on man, but I'm not doubting on Jesus. Jesus is my Lord and my God. Say, well, you ought to believe people's testimonies. Well, I do most of them if they're reasonable and sound. But if they're ludicrous, I got a problem with some of that stuff. I don't want to be critical. I want to be hateful. But the truth is, if you see an angel under every bush, there may be a problem with your head. Now, don't misunderstand me. There are people that see angels. There are people, I think there were angels around J.R.'s place when Anna was real bad. And I believe there was, I believe Rascal seen the angels probably before J.R. did. 
Why? Because rascal's more spiritual. No. You say, who's rascal? That's his dog. And, you know, I, I do think that there's things that have been seen there, and I believe that account. I believe people do see angels and see life and manifestations. But to just, you know, try to get on YouTube and say, wow, you know, whoo, I'm the pie in the sky. I'm the catch meow. Wow, look at me. I had a vision. You know, I'm about fed up with some of them visions because they were all wrong in 2020. Hello? Well, he got one piece of it right. Well, that's like finding a fly in a raisin pie. How many of you like raisin pie? I love raisin pie. I love raisin pie. It's awesome. And you talk about making your sugar spike. It does. Raisin pies are awesome. But to find a fly, even though it looks a lot like the rest of the raisins, uh-uh. It kind of, you know, causes me to have a blowout on the way to the buffet. Amen. Now, you know, I, I believe that people see visions. I believe that people see angels. I believe that there are manifestations, and, and I believe that. But please hear me. If you're going to spend all your time trying to see something, feel something, get something, you're, you're seeking the hand of God and not the face of God. And you must seek the face of God. And if you'll seek the face of God and not the hand of God, you'll be like, you'll be like Jesus said about you and I, Thomas, because you've seen, you believe. But blessed, blessed are they that have not seen, yet they believe. And I are one. Amen. I'm done. Come bring us on. I'm terribly hungry for a raisin pie. Before fly season. Anyway. Please hear me. Give God space. Give God place. Please hear me. You're passing this way never before. Keep your focus. Please hear me. Trust and believe God. Because you may see the Men as trees walk, and you may see things bigger than what they really are. Amen? We don't want to see things bigger than what they really are. I never want to forget the story I heard of a Baptist preacher telling a story. And the, this was in a revival right here in Ozark. And he, this has been 30 years ago. He's telling a story. He said, he said uh, this couple were devout Baptists, very dedicated Baptists. Now, he's speaking to a Baptist church. In revival, he said, their son got in trouble and ended up going to prison. And so the son sent a letter back to his mom and dad and said, Mom, Dad, I know you're very religious. And I know your heart's broken about what has happened with my life. But I wanted to send you word to encourage you. We took a survey in the prison and almost everybody in here are Baptists. Now you're shaking your heads and shame on you. You're, you're a Pentecostal preacher, full gospel preacher. Well, I'm just repeating the Baptist preacher. Don't get mad at me for something he said. I just quoted him. Come on. You still love me? Say, I didn't love you before. But anyway. <laughs> what an awesome God we have. Don't give up. Trust God. Believe Him. Trust Him through the, the, the maze, through the darkness. And he'll, he'll get you through. Stand with me. We're going to give an invitation.
for that sweet spirit in here tonight. At Ozark Full Gospel Church, we have three exciting services every week. Our service times are Sunday morning at 10.30, Sunday night at 6 p.m., and Wednesday night at 7 o'clock. There is meaningful praise and worship and powerful Bible preaching at every service, and we never close for any reason. In addition, be sure to follow us on social media to stay up to date with all of our upcoming events and most current information. We look forward to seeing you soon, right here where we are touching the Ozarks with Jesus Christ. And what a fellowship, what a joy.
No matter how much we may fall and stumble, underneath are those everlasting arms of God. Amen. The road of life is a long, long journey. As I look back, I see I've slipped along the way. There's no telling what road I would be traveling. Without Jesus there to guide me on my way I need his strength to lead me on to glory and I need his love to give me peace of mind I need his precious hands to lead me when I stumble He'll be there every time. Yes, he will. Jesus understands your troubles, and he'll reach out to heal the wounded soul. And when you're down and out, He'll lift you up and save you. From the bottom of the miry pit below, I need His strength to lead me on to glory. And I need His love to give me peace of mind I need his precious hands to lead me when I stumble for when I need Jesus he'll be there every time I need his precious hands to lead me when I stumble for when I need Jesus, He'll be there every time, and He will be. Amen. And I will sing when I am weak, and for the joy of the Lord is my strength, and I will in you alone you are my ever present and help in time of me and i'll sing glory to your name for you have overcome the grave there is no other name by which we must be saved i sing glory to your name and i've offered you place of the school it's where Jesus paid to send it for our song. Yep. Now I can see. Thank you, Lord. Redemption song. His blood has satisfied the wrath of God for me. Amen. And I say glory to your name. For you have overcome the grave. There is no other name by which we must be saved.
future so bright I gotta wear shades. Yes, Glory to God. No matter what comes my way, Brother Jim, I'm out on the top. I read the back of the book and we win. Hallelujah. Praise God. Hallelujah. Oh, he had mercy on me when all my hope was gone. The old world turned against me Found myself alone For this gutless life I live Reduced in evil sin Oh, but when I called on Jesus Mercy on me Well, the world promised happiness Only brought me woe It promises a pleasure Brought death to my soul Where the weights of my sin were there for me to see. I cried out for forgiveness and mercy on me. Yet mercy on me when all my hope was gone. No world turned against me. I found myself alone. But it's gone inside while I live. Produced it for see. Oh, but when I call on Mercy on me Well, like the two thieves That hung at Jesus' side I was guilty of sin And then condemned to die I cried out to the Savior Unworthy as could be Oh, but Jesus heard my prayer Yet mercy on me Yet mercy on me When all my hope was gone the old world turned against me. I found myself alone. For oh, this kind of life I live, reduced to evil seed. Oh, but when I call on Jesus, mercy on me. Now listen, oh, convicted by the Holy Ghost, facing God's your wrath, I knew I was guilty, no excuse for my past, turning to the blood of Jesus, mercy of the court I plead. I heard him say, not guilty, he had mercy on me, he had mercy on me, when all my hope was gone, the old world turned again. And I found myself alone But this kind of life I live Produced its evil seed Oh, but when I called on Jesus Mercy on me Well, you know I'm here to tell you He still saves and forgives No matter what you might have done Life that you live He shed his blood at Calvary We can live and be free You can live Yet mercy on me Oh, yet mercy on me All my hope is gone The old world turned against me And I found myself alone But it's got this life I live Reduced in evil seed Oh, but when I call on Jesus Mercy on me At Ozark Full Gospel Church, we have three exciting services every week. Our service times are Sunday morning at 10.30, Sunday night at 6 p.m., and Wednesday night at 7 o'clock. There is meaningful praise and worship and powerful Bible preaching at every service, and we never close for any reason. In addition, be sure to follow us on social media to stay up to date with all of our upcoming events and most current information. We look forward to seeing you soon, 
right here where we are touching the Ozarks with Jesus Christ. If you missed any of today's broadcast, would like to watch it again, or maybe share it with your friends, you can do that easily by heading over to our YouTube channel. Simply go to www.youtube.com forward slash Ozark Full Gospel Church. You'll find today's broadcast as well as many other great messages. While you're there, be sure to click that red subscribe button to stay up to date with all of our latest videos. It's totally free and a great way to stay connected with us.